The year was 1988. Nintendo had just successfully revived the dying video game market in North America following the video game crash of 1983. The NES was the top selling video game console worldwide, outselling their competition by a landslide. In 1988, Godzilla Monster of Monsters would also be released for the NES. The game was received well upon release, but got panned by retro collectors. The game allows the player to take control of Godzilla or Mothra. No other monsters are playable. Godzilla and Mothra must fight their way through seven different worlds, each named after a planet in the solar system, except for the final world, Planet X. Each level holds a certain amount of monsters for the duo to fight through in order to complete the planet and move on to the next. Godzilla and Mothra move from left to right like in most NES games at the time. The screen would be filled with enemies for the pair to fight. Eventually they would engage with a boss monster and would be taken to a screen that looked more akin to a fighting game. The fight would last for 40 seconds before returning to the title screen. Godzilla Monster of Monsters is a pretty simple game, but it had its merits. The sprite work for the game was pretty good, especially for the NES. The game was pretty simple as I mentioned before, but it will be the backdrop for our story. The NES Godzilla Creepypasta was released in 2011, when Creepypastas were just entering their prime. There were quite a few Creepypasta characters going viral, including Slenderman, Jeff the Killer, and The Rake, to name a few. The NES Godzilla Creepypasta was actually part of a subgenre within the Creepypasta community called the Gaming Creepypasta. As the name suggests, it's a creepypasta centered around video games. The subgenre would also see some massively popular characters emerge, namely Ben, Sonic.exe, and Hera Brian. NES Godzilla is the story of a man named Zachary. Zachary as a kid had two things that he loved most in life. Those things being Godzilla and NES games which is what led him to finding his favorite childhood game, Godzilla Monster of Monsters for the NES. He described the game as mediocre and repetitive, to which I would agree. Then goes on to say that as a child he didn't care, like many of us, we overlooked the flaws and the things that we found fun in as kids. Zachary had recently bought an NES, hoping to relive part of his childhood, and asked his friend Billy to help finding a copy of Godzilla Monster of Monsters. Billy did find a copy, along with Legend of Zelda, Bomber Man, and Action 52. He would play them all, but Godzilla was the game he set his eyes on first. The startup of the game sent a wave of nostalgia through him. The first boss came up in its Gazora, a squid kaiju that's not very strong but has an annoying attack that can stall out the fight. The fight was going pretty easy, even with Gazora's annoying attack, but the screen started to show these red graphical glitches. There were these little red blocks all over the screen. Zachary, annoyed, took out the cartridge and blew into it before reinserting the game. The game started up fine and the boss fight didn't glitch this time. He finished the two bosses and moved on to Mars. This is where Zachary would notice that this game wasn't the exact game he'd played when he was younger. Titanosaurus, a kaiju not originally in the game, now appeared to be. He was at the edge of the map as the final boss of the stage. Another Gazora fight came up and after he was defeated, the glitch reappeared. This time it devoured the squid kaiju. The eye of the squid started to flood the screen along with the glitch boxes. At this point, Zachary knew something was wrong with the game, but against his better judgment proceeded anyway. His next boss fight was against Magra. When he got into the battle with Magra, Magra was for some reason twice his normal in-game size. This made the fight harder, but since this fight was one of the easiest in the game originally, he wasn't that much harder to beat. Just as Godzilla lands the final blow, something beyond creepy happens. The Magra sprite begins to shatter and melt off the screen. This is when Zachary knew there was more to this glitch, but once again decided that his curiosity outweighed everything else. He needed to see what was happening with the rest of the game. So far, he just chalked it all up to being an unreleased version of the game. The final kaiju was defeated and he was off to the next level, Pathos. Normally the second world would be Jupiter, but it had been replaced. The actual map layout looked the same as Jupiter though. Besides a color change, the weirdest change was that Biollante was in the game. Which would have been impossible, the movie debut of Biollante wasn't until a year after the game was initially released. 
Sakari moved to the new levels, which both had new level design and music. The first level was the honeycomb levels, and they had rhythmic drumming with what sounded like screaming in the background. The blue flame levels appeared to be more like mountainous terrain with a blood red moon hanging above. These levels also noticeably had no enemies. Zachary made his way through the new levels and approached the boss monsters. He made his way to the new boss monster on the map, Violante, curious to see how the fight would be with the brand new monster. The fight was in two parts. The first part had Violante in an immobile form where she would only be able to fight by throwing out tentacle attacks. Once Godzilla had done enough damage, she would shift into her final form. The battle was over pretty quickly, and when returning to the map, the music had stopped. In the space where the base used to be, now sat a new red icon. The new icon resembled that of a tribal mask. With a bit of trepidation, Zachary moved Godzilla to the space and started the level. The new level looked like some sort of hellish world. Flames burned in the background, which looked far better than anything capable on the NES. With a steady drum beat as the only backing sound, Zachary noticed all of the text at the top was gone except for a single word. Run. Run from what? Zachary heard a noise and looked away from the screen. When he looked back, Godzilla was dying. Thinking it a glitch, he restarted his console. Navigating through the password section, he loaded back into the game and started the level once again. As the level started, he heard a low bellowing sound. The sound was followed by this thing running towards Godzilla. This is Red the main antagonist of the story, and the scariest gaming creepypasta monster. Red has spider-like legs that it walks on, a long whip-like tail, and the same mask-looking face as a level icon. He looks like a cross between a spider and a scorpion with an almost decaying human face. The creature was straight out of a nightmare. Zachary had to run because if Red touched Godzilla, then he would be instantly killed. He ran from the creature and was just barely able to outrun the Hellspawn, completing the level in the process. At this point, Zachary was ready to shut the game off forever. He would forget about this game and play something else from his games list. Once again though, his curiosity prevailed and he decided to load up the map and move on to the next world, Trance. Taking a moment to collect himself, Zachary thought about what this game could be. It could be a ROM hack, but was it possible to put a ROM hack onto a cartridge? Where had Billy gotten these games from in the first place? Too many questions and not an answer in sight. Zachary noticed on the map was a white question mark. Approaching it, he was dragged into a new kind of level, something he would call a quiz level. A quiz level had Godzilla on a black screen with a face that looked like an emoticon sitting at the top. A yes block sat on the left side of the screen with a no on the right. Face, as Zachary would refer to it, would then ask a question and Godzilla could either reply with a yes or no. Face would then change expressions based on how he answered the question. Some of the questions were kind of dark and personal, such as, do you like hurting people, or have you ever killed anyone? Has a family member ever hurt you? On the other side of the spectrum, he would ask really stupid or strange questions. Is the sun hot? Is water wet? Or does your dog like the president? Then Face would ask a final question, usually about the game. Face had a total of 23 expressions he would make based on your answers. The expressions had no effect on the game whatsoever though. Sometimes the expressions chosen also made no sense. These are the faces that face can make. The first 11 are pretty standard, but the next 12 are a little weird and don't really make sense as to what they're supposed to mean. Here are a few questions and answers that face reciprocated with. Question one, do you like the game? Answer, yes. Face, happy. Question two, are you 18? Answer, yes. Weird face number five. Question, does your dog like the president? Answer, no. Weird face number three. The quiz level was a little odd, but it had no negative or positive effects on the game, really. It was more like a side game within the main game. After that, it was back to normal levels and the normal boss fights. After the boss fights were over, it was time to move on to the base level. This time, there was no monster on it to fight, and the game took control of Godzilla and moved him to fight Orga. The fight was pretty tough. Orga eventually unhinged its jaw and tried to swallow Godzilla. From this position, Godzilla was able to shoot a heat beam directly into its mouth and did a lot of damage. 
The fight was over pretty quickly after finding this new weakness. Once returning to the map screen, the red face was back where the base once was. This was going to be a recurring level type, thought Zachary. He mentally prepared himself for it and moved on to the newly marked space. The second the level started, Zachary started running. This time, the game had small obstacles that he had to maneuver around. After about 40 seconds of running, the bellowing noise started up and Red was chasing behind him again. Red destroyed any and all obstacles in his way. When they were at head level, he would just eat them whole and keep moving. This chase would go on for a little longer as Godzilla narrowly escaped off screen. Zachary yelled at a cheer and said, Not this time, asshole. Red stopped dead in his tracks and stared directly at the screen. This moment would become the defining one for the entire creepypasta. The feeling of dread that this one look gave off was immeasurable. Whenever someone remembers the NES Godzilla creepypasta, this is the first image that pops to mind. This is also the pivotal turn in the story, when things go from weird ROM hack to something far darker. This is also when the hints of the personalized horror start to creep in, though we'll get to that topic later. Red stared forward with his hollow eye sockets directly at Zachary. He felt his blood run cold and what started as laughing excitement at beating the level turned into pure fear. He wanted to stop the game, but at this point he just couldn't. The next world was dementia and the first thing that Zachary noticed was that he had two new boss monsters on the map. He moved Godzilla to the quiz level to start the map. This quiz level was pretty similar to the first quiz level. The questions weren't really anything special this time around. That is, until the final question. Face asked, would you like a new monster? The question perplexed and excited Zachary. He wasn't sure what Face meant by new monster, but he was ready to find out. When he returned to the board, there was a new monster that was playable, Angerus. A monster he'd always wanted to be able to play. The monster even had his own unique move set. He could punch and kick like Godzilla, but the main thing that made him unique was his ability to curl into a ball and roll around the level. This was especially useful for dodging enemies in the sky, and you only took half damage if you ran into someone in this ball form. This is when Zachary realized something that he'd been thinking about for a while. This game, for some reason, had the ability to make the player feel certain things. Not in the traditional sense, like a scary enemy scaring you. It felt more manipulative than that, and he just couldn't explain it. After beating the new monster in the game, it was time once again to do a run stage. Zachary at this moment decided he needed to see how this game ended, and he'd also not speak on these stages. This run stage was similar to the other ones. Red would chase Zachary, but this time there was a river of blood that he had to dive into to escape the monster. He seemed pretty safe until the low bellowing of Red started up again. Red had transformed into some aquatic form of himself. He swam after Zachary and occasionally would launch a second mouth out of his mouth, similar to a xenomorph. He made some of the most disturbing noises as he chased Zachary. Zachary jumped out of the river of blood and narrowly escaped the claws of Red. He was safe once again, for now at least. It was onto the fifth world, Entropy. The first thing Zachary did was go to the quiz level. This one asked him a variety of strange questions before getting onto the last one. Do you like Mothra? He answered truthfully, no. Face replied, too bad. When he returned to the board, all he had was Mothra as a playable monster. Zachary was now stuck with Mothra, which only made him feel more vulnerable. Playing Mothra wasn't as fun as Godzilla, but the levels seemed to require Mothra. The first level was forest themed and had a bunch of new animal like creatures running around. They didn't try to hurt Zachary, they were just part of the level. There was also a winter themed version of the same forest level. While flying through it, Zachary saw all the creatures that he'd seen before but now they were dead and covered in snow. It appeared they froze to death, but that wasn't the case, as a horde of raptor-looking creatures ran from the right of the screen and attacked the only living creature left on screen. Then he came upon the moon, only it wasn't really the moon. It started to crack like an egg and dropped something into the water. Moments later, a giant creature sprang forth from the water's edge. Zachary called this enemy the Moon Beast. The fight was kind of tough, but it wasn't impossible by any means. This is where the story takes a bit of a turn. Remember how I mentioned personalized horror? 
This is where that comes into play, as Zachary's reward for killing the Moon Beast was a reminder of a traumatizing experience from his past. Zachary had a girlfriend in middle school named Melissa. She had some kind of mental disorder that caused her to have episodes, as she would call them. She would sit or stand perfectly straight and lose any hint of emotion from her face. Then she would start trembling and remain silent for several minutes. One night, while the pair were hanging out in a field late at night watching the stars, Melissa had an episode while staring at the moon. Zachary tried to talk to her, but she wouldn't respond to him. A second later, she broke from her episode and ran straight into traffic while screaming. That night haunted Zachary for years. Even as he tried to repress it, this is what the game had presented to him. The game had dug into the deepest, most disturbed part of Zachary's psyche and pulled out his trauma. It was toying with him in the same way a shark might bump its prey before dismembering it. The game wanted Zachary to know that it knew everything about him. This concept is probably the best part of the NES Godzilla creepypasta, not only because of how interesting the concept is, but because it also helps to explain other gaming creepypastas. Whenever someone finds a copy of their favorite childhood game and notices creepiness that wasn't there before, the cause could be because the game is personalized to them, and that's why they're the only ones who experience it. It helps to rationalize a lot of creepypasta that seem to just happen upon creepy versions of their games. Most of those stories don't take it to the same level that NES Godzilla does though, as this game rips your trauma straight out of you and makes you experience it firsthand. After that moment, Zachary wanted to stop, but he just couldn't. No matter how he tried to rationalize it, the game wouldn't let him leave. He was too involved now, and the game didn't want him to leave either, obviously. He had to see it to its end. Zachary made his way to the new run stage and found himself in a maze this time. It was his worst fear, a maze that he had to navigate while avoiding Red. To make matters worse, Red could just destroy parts of the wall, and he also had transformed once again. This time he was able to fly on bat-like wings. Luckily, Zachary picked the right path and was able to escape Red once again. He was lucky in more ways than one, he supposed. He was ready to leave this world and move on to the next world, Extus. When the board for the next world loaded up, Zachary saw that he had Godzilla back, but that Angaris was gone. It was fine, since if he had to choose between the two, he'd have rather had Godzilla anyways. Starting up the next quiz level, it seemed to ask pretty serious questions this time, as well as ask some pretty mundane questions. Face asked if he would like a new monster. Zachary answered yes. Once again, it was the final question that stood out though. Face asked, will you miss me? Zachary answered yes, and Face responded with his sad expression. The new monster that he got wasn't anything that he'd ever seen before. The new monster's name was Solomon, and he was a bat-like creature with a skull-like face. He wasn't ever in a Godzilla movie before. The weird thing about Solomon is that when you complete a level, some text and a picture will pop up. The picture is of Solomon, with a caption that reads, Still the best, 1973. This is a legitimate mystery outside of the creepypasta. The creepypasta community still doesn't know the answer to this, actually. My theory is that it somehow relates to the follow-up creepypasta, but I'll get to that later. This level had a boss rush area of sorts. Zachary entered with Solomon, and had to fight his way through a good chunk of the bosses in the game. They were easy at first, until they merged into a giant chimera. This was the true boss of the stage. Zachary defeated Chimera and moved on to a stage that had a cross on it. He wasn't able to enter with Solomon though, and he had to use Godzilla. The stage looked like a graveyard with gravestones placed against a black background. Zachary then came upon a blue angel looking creature. It floated above what looked like a tomb. At first he was scared of it, but then felt oddly comforted by it. It just floated there, not doing anything to hurt him in any way. Just as Zachary turned to leave, the world burst into flame and Red appeared. Red lunged for the kill, but the angel jumped in the way. Red tore the angel apart and started to devour it just as Zachary was able to escape. You're going to pay, Zachary said as he left. Red turned to the screen once again. He stared for a moment before opening his mouth and letting out a low bellowing scream. 
The final level was coming up, and Zachary hoped he'd be able to keep his threat. The final level was Zenith. Zenith, in Zachary's own words, would prove to be the most disturbing of the worlds so far. First thing he noticed was the new blood red texture of the board itself. It was an ominous color for things to come. Entering the quiz level first, as is routine, Zachary was met with this. Face had been murdered. Blood was running from his mouth and in the most grotesque way. The music, which usually was pretty creepy, was now distorted. The yes and no started to glitch out just as Zachary left the level. There was also a new monster on the board, but Zachary couldn't select it for some reason. Every time he did, he would get a message that said, no, in red letters. He didn't understand it, but he had to move on. The levels in this world were all tinged the same blood red as the board. The levels featured some of the most grotesque enemy designs up to this point as well. There was even a red version of the angel from the previous stage, the one that read eight. This one was not calming in the slightest. The next level's boss was formed from the bodies of dead monsters that Zachary had previously fought. It was a very disturbing looking mashup of body parts. It wasn't very hard to beat, as you just needed to target the cluster at the head. The imagery here was a lot more disturbing than the rest of the game had even come close to being. The game seemed to be spiraling with this last world. It was as if the game was taking Zachary through the most disturbing part of his own mind. Parts he didn't even know he could imagine. The final world appeared to be hell on earth, with demon-like creatures popping up everywhere. They appeared to want nothing more than to stop Zachary from reaching the end. After successfully beating the bosses of this world, it was time to move to the red space. Starting it, the screen went as black for a moment before the eyes of red could be seen in the darkness, and the fight was ready to begin. The fight with red was Zachary's toughest yet, not only because the boss was tough and he had a lot of health, but because Zachary could feel the pain of every single attack red hit him with. Very real physical pain. Zachary was paralyzed to his seat and couldn't move. He tried desperately to get up and turn off the NES, but to no avail. He was stuck and a message on screen came up saying, you are not leaving. The battle with Red was a grueling one. He took very little damage from most of Godzilla's attacks, but he was getting whittled down. Zachary changed monsters after each break to make sure he didn't lose any of them. Zachary would eventually switch to Mothra, and this would prove to be his biggest mistake. The fight didn't last long before Red reached out, grabbed Mothra, and started to devour her. This sent a great pain through Zachary's body as he had to live with his decision. After getting Red to a low enough health, he started to fly around the screen and attack Solomon. Zachary was able to stop his movements and bring him to his final form. The screen zoomed out to a flaming background and the final form of Red appeared. This form was considerably stronger and much bigger. There was no way Zachary would win this fight, but he had to try. Red killed Solomon in a few shots. Zachary's strongest monster was gone, just like that. Red tore through Zachary's collection of monsters like they were first level bosses. A message popped up on screen. You can't win, Zachary. How do you know my name, he asked. Another message popped up on screen. I've known you for a long time. I'll tell you a secret. I killed Melissa. Zachary struggled with what Red was saying. It started to make sense though. The thing that Melissa was struggling with was Red. It had taken her life and now was going to take his. Zachary had no choice but to send out Godzilla, his final monster. The fight wasn't looking good either, as Red easily outclassed Godzilla's damage and health. Godzilla was then also eaten by Red, a sour end to his first monster. Just as Red was about to kill Zachary, the blue angel from before showed up. It was Melissa, and she was giving him access to that final monster. It was a golden looking creature, but it was much more powerful than any of the previous monsters he'd used. The fight wasn't easy, but it was at least manageable now. Zachary was able to fight toe to toe with Red. Through a narrow victory, Red was defeated with a final blow. The creature then disintegrated into ash before Zachary, and he was free from the control of the game. A final screen came up with Melissa and all of his monsters thanking him for saving them. With a final message on the screen reading, thank you for saving us, we'll be together again someday. With that somber goodbye, Zachary decided he needed to sleep. 
The next day he contacted Billy. He really needed to know where he got this game from. Billy came over to his apartment right away. It took some convincing, but Billy finally believed him about everything. Billy explained how he got his games from the same guy every time, a guy that he knew was trustworthy. The pair called up the guy who seemed to be as perplexed as them about the whole situation, but before they could ask any more questions, he hung up on them. Billy then asked Zachary if he wanted him to get rid of the game for him, but Zachary declined. Zachary, torn between playing the game again and destroying it, decided on a third option. He would sell the game on eBay. This was a selfish move, he tells us, but he doesn't want the responsibility of owning it anymore. He then puts out this final message about the game. If it seems like the game is messing with you, shut it off. That was the story of one of the greatest game creepypastas of all time. Other than the divisive ending of the story, it is still one of the best creepypastas ever written. The ending can be a bit cheesy, seeming like the power of love conquers all, but I think the ending is still important to the overall narrative. There's one more section in this story I want to talk about though, and that is the section involving Billy's friend, the one he got the games from. This might be an outlandish claim, but what if this person who Billy got the games from is the source of all gaming creepypastas? My theory goes like this. This person is the same person that the author of Ben Drowned received his copy of Majora's Mask from. It's also the same person who had a copy of Super Mario 64 available for sale online, but only sold it to a specific seller. This person has been secretly giving personalized copies of games to individuals that they believe will be able to connect with them. This theory explains the multitude of gaming creepypastas that involve people finding a childhood game that they are deeply, personally connected to and finding something creepy or strange in it. The mysterious game seller is like the haunted mask salesman. They find ways of getting personalized copies of games to people, sometimes for the better, but usually for the worse. NES Godzilla was just the beginning. Maybe you'll receive your own copy of a personalized game. Only time will tell. Hopefully it doesn't dig into the deepest crevices of your mind and pull something out that you didn't want. I know there's a sequel in the works to the NES Godzilla creepypasta called NES Godzilla Replay, but I like to give it its own video. Overall, the NES Godzilla creepypasta is probably one of my favorites of all time, and the reason I hope the genre never dies out. I want to thank you all for watching this video. Subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you all in the next one.